When you need an expert in copyright law, you hire a copyright firm. You have an employment case, you get an employment lawyer. In a state court business dispute, you get a state court business litigator who knows the state judges. And when you are in an appeal on one of those cases, who do you go hire? No one, that's right. You continue on with your existing lawyer because this is just the next phase of a case, like going from the pleadings to discovery, right? Wrong. You just made a big mistake. Data shows that around 90% of all appeals are lost in federal appellate jurisdictions. In experience, it shows almost 90% of all cases continue with the same lawyer from the trial court to the court of appeals. Coincidence? No. Why does this mistake happen? Appellate courts may look like trial courts. The judges are wearing robes. You file your briefs electronically. You've got law books on the courtroom table. And you have a courtroom clerk you check in with. There are flags behind the bench and the judges, and then you sit at counsel table. But don't be fooled. They operate with a completely different center of gravity to the trial court. Almost every assumption you make about litigating in the trial court is off base when you go on appeal. And when you are going on appeal, whether to seek a reversal or to hold the ground you won, you need to talk to a lawyer who knows that court, its governing poll stars, and its center of gravity. If you want to win on appeal, you must fundamentally recognize that you need to speak to an appellate lawyer, one with the right skill set for this phase of a case. Because at the end of the day, as we're going to explore today, an appeal is not simply an extension of what you've done before, and it's not even close. I've been an appellate litigator for almost 20 years now. I clerked on the Federal Court of Appeals, and I teach a federal appellate clinic at the University of California Irvine School of Law. I've litigated upwards of 100 appeals for my clients, many with my students, where I taught them the appellate litigation process step by step. As an appellate litigator and clinical instructor on appellate law, I have, through sheer experience, developed multiple critical insights into the appellate process, born from the rough experience of the appellate trenches and the need to clinically teach how to do the job. As an appellate litigator brought in by sophisticated general counsels to look at trial court proceedings, I've repeatedly seen where the process breaks down if appellate counsel is not retained. There are myriad key insights, and in a brief overview, not everything can be addressed. But over the next half hour, I am going to share some fundamental insights with you, such as the currency of credibility in structuring your appeal, knowing what fences exist to control your audience of appellate judges, and how to get over those fences and some of the insights on structuring an appellate oral argument. So, before we explore how to win on appeal, I want to discuss with you the staggering differences between the two court systems, trial on the one hand and appellate on the other hand, so that the insights we then address have a proper context. This is critical because litigation in the trial court is not the same as litigating an appeal, and to understand this context, we need to briefly think about the different court systems. First, when you file a lawsuit, you are assigned to a judge and you can do your intelligence on the judge to understand that specific judge's proclivities, leanings, writing style preferences even. You tailor your written product to a known entity, in other words. You have a target. But on appeal, you don't know your audience at the time of writing that appeal. You only know a range of judges who may hear your case. And that has massive consequences on the front end for how you even frame your issues on appeal. Second, trial court writings must convince one person to do something in the first instance. There are facts and law, and you have to mount the better version of the facts given the articulation of the law you offer. You're not required to overcome deference to any state of affairs. It's a clean shot you take. Appellate writings, however, you now have to convince three jurists from different backgrounds to undo, when you're the appellant, undo the reasoning and work of another judge, and to undo it, when there's often a legally mandated amount of deference to be given to the decision. That's right. A whole range of trial court decisions are given deference, such that an appellate court may look at what the trial court did and say, hey, if I were the trial judge, I wouldn't have done that. But it doesn't matter because reasonable minds can differ. And so even something that I may have done differently, I'll still affirm it as an appellate judge. That's a big difference. Third. Trial courts expect, without reservation, 
multiple theories and approaches to get through pretrial and then to get to your jury. And advancing innumerable theories is simply not fatal. But appellate courts, they don't expect or even tolerate myriad alternative theories and claims. And the same approach that yields success often in the trial court condemns you to failure in the appellate court system. Fourth, trial courts routinely grant significant time to discuss law and motion orally. I've had the experience in the trial court of arguing a large trademark case at summary judgment where the trial court allowed two hours of argument spread out over an entire day from 8 a.m. until late at night. And that time was needed. But appellate courts, appellate courts jealously limit you to 10, maybe 15 minutes to discuss the same issue with three inquisitive minds. And on appeal, that can be done as we'll discuss soon, given a deep understanding of how your written work product is assessed before you even show up to talk about it. But you have to know how, and that's why an appellate lawyer is critical. These root differences have a profound impact on appeal in terms of what you should write, how you should write it, and what you should do at oral argument in an appellate setting. So, from this foundation, let's get to winning your appeal with some key insights and deliverables. The first issue I want to discuss falls under the rubric of credibility. You must understand how the currency of credibility on appeal is so different to the trial court. An exchange rate exists between the two venues, and if you don't know it, you're falling short in what is needed to prevail. Let me start with this quote from United States Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, penned by him in an article decades ago, a quote that holds true today. Legal contentions, like the currency, depreciate through overissue. The mind of an appellate judge is habitually receptive to the suggestion that a lower court committed an error. But receptiveness declines as the number of assigned errors increases. Multiplicity hints at lack of confidence in any one. That is a cardinal principle. This critical relationship between credibility and assigning error cannot be overstated. Like it or not, right or wrong, fair or unfair, there simply is an inverse ratio between the number of assignments of error you make and your very credibility on any one issue you press. Myriad assignments of error simply dilute all claims to the point that a good argument can be drowned in the cacophony of assigned errors. Now, in the trial court in a breach of contract case, people routinely assert claims for breach of contract, unfair business practices, and other tort claims, trying to skin the issue as a tort too. When that complaint is filed, the trial court doesn't look at it and assume that it's meritless or that it's thin because you have myriad theories. But on appeal, if you press those same alternate theories, you instantly damage your credibility. That means that if you have in the midst of all the theories one good one, you're likely to hinder the appellate court's willingness to even see that as an error because you've said everything was an error. So what does this mean for you on appeal? It means no matter how much you think the trial court erred along the way, you have to limit your choices to assigning error in a few instances. If you are telling the appellate court that the trial judge literally could not do a single thing correct, and get, we've all been there, I get it. But if that's what you're saying, then you've already lost your audience's receptivity to consider any given action as being one imbued with error. And you've doomed, doomed what could be a winning argument to a losing one. By assigning too many errors, you've fallen off the sliding scale. Think about this from a practical perspective. Trial court decisions, they're presumed correct as a matter of law. But that, of course, is a legal fiction and structure that we work with. Let's put that aside. Let's understand the very practical nature of the court system you're now in. At a practical level, the appellate judges know the trial court judge. They know the trial court judge, having reviewed myriad decisions of that judge, where, remember, statistically, they've affirmed 90% of the time. Pause on that. That shows they know the trial judge can do things correctly and does so most of the time. But they also know the judge personally from conferences and court events. So at the street level, they can't believe the trial judge is just an idiot incapable of doing anything correct. And if your narrative presses that, which it does when you assign too many errors, then you've lost your audience before you even begin. 
the appellate judges practically know the trial judge gets things right most of the time. So if you're delivering to them a narrative fatally at odds with their root understanding of the trial judge, then you've instantly lost your audience. This is where appeals are most often lost. Out of the gate, in the opening brief, where the message delivered is that you are right and you were sidetracked by some bumbling idiot below. Instead, you need to assign scant errors, and the judges are then perfectly willing to believe that this judge they know made a mistake. To err is human, after all, and judges recognize they all make mistakes on occasions. And when appellate judges see an appeal, the first thing they look at and see is who is that judge below. And the next thing they should see if you're doing it right is that this judge simply made a mistake, an explainable mistake within the narrative of your situation. Now, this is staggeringly hard for a trial court lawyer to do for its own systemic reasons. Trial lawyers really believe in their theory. They pressed it below and they were paid to do so. And this is not to say they were wrong. They weren't. But they were operating in a different system where that approach was fine. To recognize such a foundational shift in approach is hard and it often creates tension. Sometimes when I work with trial counsel in a handoff situation, it's obvious they fear being second guessed. And it's not a question of second guessing them or their decisions. It's a question of understanding the rules of the new venue that you're in. After all, it is hard to suddenly have to abandon ship on things that one firmly believed in. It feels like defeat or failure, but it's not. It's actually wise strategy for appeal to focus in on a few key errors that fit a larger narrative. This currency of credibility posits a firm exchange rate. You may not like that exchange rate, but it exists from the moment you decide what you even tee up in your written brief at the outset of your appeal. You innately want to resist the exchange rate. It feels wrong or unfair. But if you don't abide by it, you will find your pockets empty in your appellate transaction. Knowing how to maintain maximum credibility and assign the right errors, that's how you win an appeal. And you do it by talking to lawyers who do that exchange rate for a living. Let's move to the second key lesson for winning your appeal, and it's knowing your audience and the controls placed on them. We're all used to trial judges, especially life-appointed district court judges that can do almost anything they want in their cases. There are judges who might make you come to court late at night for argument, no joke. I clerk for a district court judge also, and I'll never forget her describing the awesome power of a single lone person, a single judge. She said, on a preliminary injunction motion, given the facts and law at issue, she could order the Navy to blockade a port. Think about that. They have staggering power, seemingly limitless power, and they sit alone. And lawyers cater to that, aware of it and cautious how to tread around it. But appellate judges are actually fenced in by controlling principles independent of the issues before them. And they sit in a group, three of them together, sorting out decisions so you avoid some of those ego issues that lone judges have. There are these external fences then that uniquely control their ability to act. To win on appeal, you must understand what these fences are and know how to get over them. The most basic one is the standard of review. This is the prism by which they must review the trial court's behavior. And legally, they are required in a whole range of cases and issues to grant deference. They must, even if they would have done it differently sitting in the trenches, they must still defer to the judge in the trenches if the action falls within a range of reasonableness. So, for you as an appellant, this poses a staggering problem on appeal. Those judges may disagree with what happened below, but they legally still have to affirm it. So the key move, the key move an appellate lawyer makes when confronting these mandatory grants of deference to trial courts is to find a creative way to reframe the issue, to unpackage what happened, and to frame it in purely legal terms. Because, if you can reframe that mistake from one that involved permitted discretionary behavior to simply an error of law, then you've freed your audience from deference and restraints. That's called de novo review, and it's the holy grail of appellate lawyers to find a means to unbridle your appellate judges. Appellate lawyers work with the law in creative ways to address the deferential death kiss by reframing matters within bodies of law or by addressing the legal framework at varying levels of abstraction. And these are skills appellate lawyers develop. They're skills that trial lawyers don't even necessarily need, a 
as they don't face the institutional bias or deference against an outcome. Now, there's a related massive legal principle you must understand and work with, one that's not present in the trial courts. There's now a winning party, and there's a legally mandated bias in favor of that winning party. The trial court, of course, is the opposite. There's no bias in favor of the plaintiff and against the defendant just by virtue of filing a lawsuit. But now on appeal, simply by filing an appeal, you confront a legal bias against you as the filer, a systemic legal predisposition to actually think all else being equal, you're wrong. Pause and consider that. No such predisposition exists in your trial court case. That's written on a blank canvas. And so this requires, again, creative lawyering to address the error within the amount of required deference to overcome that systemic bias. There's also a third fence here, a showing of prejudice to justify reversing something that a court may think and agree is wrong. Showing an error alone is not enough. You must actually show the error prejudiced you. In other words, errors are actually fine to appellate judges. People err after all. It's errors that harm you that matter. So working around these fences, it's everything. Being right, being right's not enough. Being right in the right way. That's what appellate lawyers must do. And that's the second insight today about why you need appellate counsel when you go on appeal. There's a second component to appellate lessons that flow from understanding your audience. It's how to write your brief to an audience of three judges whom you don't know. Remember, you know your trial judge. Here are briefs, they're filed months before you know your audience on appeal. What does this mean? In 20 years and scores of appeals, this has led to another critical insight. You must find a way to frame the error below in process-oriented terms. What do I mean by this? If your pitch is that the substantive fairness of a rule or outcome goes your way and not the other way, then you'd better draw a panel of judges who share that policy or political preference if you don't, you're dead in the water. And because you don't know your panel, you take a massive risk if that's your root argument. But, but if you can find a way to frame the error below in terms of a failed process, then you've built an argument foundation that jurists of all political or policy persuasions, they can agree with. Whether conservative or liberal, my experience has been that judges of all stripes want a fair and a balanced process. And so arguments built in that light, those arguments appeal to the widest possible audience of who you may get as your judge. Let me give you a concrete example of this. Years ago, I had an, an appeal. It was on behalf of an immigrant whose immigration case was thrown out of the immigration courts because she didn't file a timely notice of appeal within the immigration court system. There was a massive issue of the substantive fairness of expecting my non-English speaking client to be able to pro se file appeals on certain forms within certain deadlines, checking the right boxes, et cetera. But waxing on about the need to help those people struck me as a dangerous gamble because I didn't know my audience. So I found a way to work with the law to posit that the government form was itself infirm for everyone, not just non-English speaking immigrants, but for government lawyers also who wanted to file their own appeals. And the error was in how the form was written. This triggered the ability to argue into procedural due process law and argue that there was a form problem as opposed to this particular person having been treated unfairly. It was a pure process-oriented argument. I got a conservative panel when I got to my oral argument and normally in that type of case, I'd be worried, but I won. And I got a published opinion from a very conservative jurist writing about the need to guarantee procedural due process. I'm quite sure, indeed I'm certain, that if I'd framed the argument through the lens of substantive fairness principles, with that audience, I would have lost the appeal. This need to find the process-oriented error that reaches the widest common denominator jurist is something I teach my students every year in every case, and I tirelessly force myself to work on building my legal arguments for my clients on appeal through that very prism. That's another cardinal principle of appellate advocacy that you must know or else you'll run head on into it and you'll take a massive risk with your appeal. The third lesson today is about appellate oral advocacy, what to do and critically what not to do. 
In the trial court, you're routinely given ample time to address everything you want to. The trial court even invariably asks if there's anything else you want to say. Now, they do that because they want to show the appellate court they gave every indulgence to you before they ruled against you. That means one thing. Trial court lawyers can appear and argue every little point, hoping to find something that sticks. But in the appellate court, you now have almost always 10 minutes of time to say what you need to say. This means that even once you filed your briefs narrowing the issues, remember as we discussed earlier, a hard thing to do itself, you must now do it again. And you have to narrow your discussion from your briefs that may have raised three or four issues down to one or two issues for oral argument. And you need to do it in a way where you control the clock, your 10 minute clock, and where you don't get sidetracked on matters that don't matter. Let's take this apart with an example. Imagine hypothetically we have a case where you have an appellate brief that raised two main issues. You have a copyright issue and a trade secret issue. The copyright issue involves two components, whether the work meets the originality standard and whether there was even substantial similarity between the plaintiff and defendant's work. And the trade secret ruling you're appealing raises two sub-issues too, whether the matter was even a secret and whether it had independent economic value. Two main issues, but really four sub-issues overall. You have 10 minutes. You need to hold two to three for rebuttal, so you really have seven to eight minutes to talk about this, and you're talking to three judges. You cannot effectively discuss both the copyright and trade secret issues and their two subpoints each. You can't do it in 10 minutes, let alone seven or eight, without doing a disservice to all your issues. You can't do it. This is a cardinal mistake made by trial court lawyers who argue their cases on appeal. They just can't accept that they can't talk about everything. But you have to. And that requires being comfortable that some of your arguments, they stand or fall on the briefing. No further words. So you have to now decide what you let stand on the briefing and what you're going to address at oral argument. This itself requires an act of applying our currency of credibility. Why is this important? Because almost every time you argue an appeal this way and make clear what you are addressing, you eliminate a judge taking you away from your point to another point, and you get their buy-in to the discussion being around what you want to talk about. This lets you focus deeply on what you need to focus on and substantially reduces the likelihood the judges sidetrack you on other issues. Let's illustrate this by assuming you have not narrowed your oral argument presentation focus, and so you, having argued the case in the trial court, get up to argue it on appeal and you're there to argue everything. This is then what happens, and it's bad. May it please the court, Peter Afrasiabi, counsel for appellant. The lower court erred in its summary judgment on the copyright issues of originality and substantial similarity and the trade secret issues of secrecy and independent economic value. The trial court ignored lots of evidence, made wrong evidence rulings, misunderstood how California state law and trade secrets works. It also confused federal copyright standards between the circuits, blah, 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 blah. Note, you actually still haven't even explained what the error was and why you're standing there before these three judges. But now you get a question on originality, and so you start answering it. And another judge says, well, what about the similarity issue and where's the evidence of that? So now you're ping-ponged over there, and you start answering that, never having finished your originality point. So you answer the question and you pivot back to answer that. But they want to stay on similarity. And then a third judge wants to discuss trade secret. You see where this is going. You can't really unpackage any issue without being tossed around between all the issues. So you never say a lot about anything in particular. And you never feel satisfied. Oral argument is always about handling being a ping pong ball to some extent. That's the innate nature of it. You got three judges asking you questions. But you've allowed yourself to be a ping pong ball in the Olympics of ping pong, getting bounced around endlessly across myriad topics so that you can never make the really core points you want to make on the one issue that matters. This is why you routinely hear the refrain from trial court lawyers who go up to the appellate court that the court just didn't listen. They didn't get a chance to say everything they wanted. They just got questions and no one would listen to them. It's true. They didn't say what they needed to, but that's because they didn't go prepared to say only what they needed to say. They appeared wanting to say too much. It's like the old adage about showing up with a knife to a gunfight. You can't show up to oral argument to discuss your brief. 
You're there to discuss a subset of stuff in your brief. If you've been through this process nearly 100 times, you know, you know that you must choose just a few points and augment them from the briefs and illuminate them from the court. The true pivot points on which your case turns, points you've decided are worthy of your seven to eight minutes to really amplify and augment them from the court, to show the error below, divorced from everything else. And then you don't leave, you don't leave ever feeling that you're aggrieved and you weren't heard. I can honestly say I've not had an oral argument in the last 15 years where I felt time was so short that we lacked the time to say what was needed to be said. Getting to this point, however, that requires sticking with the currency of credibility. So now let's take our same hypothetical case and let's do it in a manner that allows you as much as possible to control your clock and the dialogue. This is done by being laser focused on what the error is and what you're there to talk about and what you're not there to talk about. It would go something like this. May it please the court, Peter Afrasiabi, counsel for the appellant. There are two core issues in this appeal that I will address today. One, the lower court erred in light of the minimal creativity standard adopted by the Supreme Court when it concluded the design of the device at issue lacked originality because there were multiple aesthetic options. Second, the trial court erred in concluding that the designs were never treated as a secret disregarding the NDAs and the employment agreements that provided for secrecy. Turning to the first issue on originality. Okay, so what we've done here is the following. First, we've told the court what we aim to address succinctly in the first 30 seconds. Second, we've said what's off the table from our perspective. Only two of those four issues on our slide, we've said the other two, they can stand on the briefs. Now, that doesn't, of course, guarantee the judges won't ask about the other two sub-issues. But I'll tell you, almost 90% of the time, in my experience, it has that exact effect. That means one thing. You've now helped make sure that your limited time can be used on only what matters to best have the chance of winning. Third, the other thing you've accomplished is that you've identified the two core issues. The, US possessed, the USB possessed some minimal creativity, and the design plans were under an NDA, so they were secret. And you've explained in those immediate 30 seconds why the court should reverse. That means in 30 seconds, the court knows the core of the appeal, the root error, and how you're gonna win. Collaterally, you're more likely to draw questions only on those issues, and that allows you to make the many subpoints you wanna make about those issues to really drive home why you should win. So, if you remember the first example, when I did the hypothetical um, oral argument, there was a long wind up about the whole case, what happened below, all sorts of issues on evidence, and really those first 30 seconds were wasted, wasted without giving a roadmap that limited the discussion to a narrow topic and without identifying even the exact error and the exact basis for reversal. And that, that argument, that's the typical argument given all the time in the Court of Appeals, and it eliminates the ability to control the dialogue and to make an effective presentation. Narrowing your playing field with this roadmap almost always, in my experience, causes judges to not burn up your clock on the issues you set aside. Sometimes they still ask, and that's fine. But most of the time when that has happened to me, I used my clock on what mattered to me, and then they tell me they have other queries about the other issues, and they actually gave me more time to address those additional issues. In essence, they treated the other issues as being off the clock type issues. That's a massive win because now you've actually secured more time to stand before those judges and press your case. So here's the skill, my deliverable to you. At oral argument, you must, in 30 seconds, identify the root error upon which your appeal hinges and upon which reversal must occur. If you can't do it in 30 seconds, you've not reduced your case to its essence. But my case is too complicated, it requires more time, it's just too difficult. I hear it all the time. No, it's not. If you require more time to distill the essence of your case, then you've not figured out the essence of your case and the issues at play. That's what we appellate lawyers do. Every appeal, every appeal can be explained and articulated in terms of this roadmap and distillation of error in 30, maybe 45 seconds. It's done every single time by hewing closely to the currency of credibility. I hope that if you leave this presentation with one clear concept in your mind today, it's that going on appeal is not simply another step in the litigation process. It's a new court, 
with a new center of gravity and a whole new set of rules. It may look like a similar court, but you've really moved into a new orbit around a new planet, even if you're in the same solar system. Today I shared some of the means by which credibility works in the appellate system and some of the different structural headwinds you confront. I've shared some critical insights and guideposts so that you can maximize your odds of succeeding in the appellate system. But there are more critical principles that animate the appellate universe. Some involve things as minor as introductions. The appellate rules generally never require one, but do you write one anyway? And if so, to what end? And how short should you keep it? And how does it serve the narrative of your brief? Other questions involve much grander issues about the nature of justice from the appellate court. The trial court, of course, only cares about who wins. Plaintiff, defendant, has little precedential effect. But the appellate court, it's making law for tens of millions of people. This role of the court then casts a shadow on everything it does, and that impacts you and your appeal. Appellate lawyers, therefore, have to confront and understand how this one case fits into larger concepts of justice, and whether this appeal is about justice between the parties, or is it really about justice for a larger jurisdiction, and the two may be at odds in any given case. How do those two issues reconcile, and how do you harmonize them? All these appellate principles are what appellate lawyers grapple with, ponder, day in, day out. Winning on appeal is never easy, but it can only be done if your lawyer knows how appellate justice operates. Thanks for watching. You're paying a lot of money for your outside litigators. You're paying that money because what happens in litigation is important. And you want to make sure the work is done right. I have bad news. You're probably not getting what you're paying for. And you may not even know it. The problem is that because of the nature of modern business litigation, decision makers like you do not get the information you need to make informed decisions. And litigators have been allowed to stop valuing and stop developing the skills they need to do their jobs properly. Most lawyers, that is, no longer understand that their primary job is to be a storyteller for the client. And most lawyers don't know how to develop their client's story. So we're going to do four things today. We're going to identify the problems with the current state of litigation practice. Why do you as in-house counsel lack important information you need to make sound decisions? And why are litigators able to avoid developing skills that would have been taken for granted 50 or 100 years ago. Second, we're going to talk about the consequences to you and your companies of the problems we identify. Third, we're going to talk about what your outside litigator should be doing to develop your story. And finally, we're going to talk about what you can do differently to protect yourself and your company. Let's start by identifying the circumstances that I believe have led to certain problems in the legal profession. The circumstances? Civil litigators rarely try cases. Now, just about everybody knows that, but the lack of trials is pretty astounding. Between 1962 and 2012, the number of civil filings in federal court rose fivefold, and the number of jury trials actually fell. Between September 2015 and September 2016, over 291,000 civil cases were filed in the federal courts. During that same time period, there were 1,758 jury trials nationwide. In the Central District of California, where I practice most of the time, there were over 14,000 civil case filings. There were only 78 jury trials. Now, you may not have known these specific figures, but you probably already knew that civil jury trials are a rare and dying thing. We all know that. It is possible to become a very senior litigation partner at a very prestigious firm charging, shall we say, very prestigious rates and never have played any role at all in a jury trial. Now, what's the practical effect of all this? Well, I want you to imagine that you're responsible for hiring a basketball coach for your organization. This is actually a pretty important position because significant money hangs in the balance. In this league, teams are awarded cash prizes for victories and they suffer financial penalties for losses. That means the CEO cares about this basketball league. So does the board, and therefore, so do you. But there's a twist. This is an unusual basketball league in that teams very seldom play a game. They practice a lot. They occasionally show up for scheduled games and warm up. Sometimes, though it's rare, 
They even tip off, tip off and start the game. But almost always, at some point before the game is actually played, the teams agree to call it off. Instead of taking the risk of getting hit with the financial penalties that come with a loss, the two teams have a discussion, sometimes with the referee as a mediator, money exchanges hands, and everybody goes home. Now this crazy basketball hypothetical is, of course, exactly the situation we have with civil litigation and litigators. We pay litigators to prepare for games that almost never happen. We all know this, but let's pause and answer our first big question. So what? Is this something you should even care about? Let me give you three reasons why you should. The fact is that most litigators spend all of their time churning a file in discovery, and most have very little, if any, useful trial experience, and three problems flow from this. First, while trials may be uncommon, they still do happen occasionally. And when they do, when you're actually going to have to play a game for once, it certainly helps to have somebody who knows what they're doing to try your case. The truth is trying cases requires a skill set that most litigators simply do not have. Let me give just one example of this. You can be a fantastic litigator pre-trial if you're smart, hardworking, and a creative thinker. But trying cases requires some additional skills that most litigators do not have, or at least do not develop, namely charisma. If you can't keep the room's attention when you talk, trial work is probably not for you, and a very quick mental processor. You can spend time thinking about the other side's summary judgment brief. You're going to have a week or two weeks to respond to their arguments. A trial, you don't have that luxury. You have to make decisions instantly. You have to connect dots, including unexpected dots, instantly. You have to be able to change the anticipated script instantly. Now, one possible solution to this problem is simply to engage a trial lawyer when it appears that a particular case may actually have to be tried. And this is a good idea if you are possibly headed to trial and your current litigator doesn't know anything about trial work. But this isn't an ideal solution because a trial presentation is built during discovery. Often when a trial lawyer takes over a case that's been handled by someone else through the pretrial stages, he or she is sorely disappointed with the state of the evidence in the case. Why? Because trials are about competing stories, and stories have elements that most lawyers don't even think about during discovery. Things like setting, character development, and plot details that are not obvious to a non-storyteller. Instead, what happens is you get handed a pile of written discovery and deposition transcripts, and then you have to craft a story out of the materials there, even if they were not properly developed. This is not a good practice. Imagine if other storytellers worked this way. Do you think Steven Spielberg simply collected up lots of footage of boats and the ocean and sea life, and then at the last minute tried to craft a story from all that random footage when he made Jaws? And he was very lucky that Hey, the stuff I have here could make a great shark movie. Is that the way he would have gone about his job? It's absurd to even think about, yet that is exactly what most lawyers do. We spend a significant amount of time gathering up facts with little regard for the final product, the final story. And then we hand it to somebody shortly before trial and say, here, craft a story out of this. It's the wrong approach. Second. Trials are uncommon, but truth be told, they should probably happen more frequently than they do. And often the reason they don't is because of the lawyers. Now keep in mind, you cannot control the settlement position of the other side. You can increase pressure inside or outside of the litigation on occasion, but you cannot force the other side to be reasonable. This means if your lawyer does not know how to prepare a case for trial and does not feel comfortable ultimately trying a case, and most don't, even the really expensive ones, you're sometimes going to get forced into bad settlements. Now, I've heard lawyers brag about how they've never had to go to trial, but are we really to believe that in every single one of those cases that those lawyers have handled, the other side was reasonable in its demands? Look, no business would sign every agreement put in front of them. You have to be willing to walk away from a bad deal. Otherwise, you end up signing lots of bad deals. 
If you never walk away from a deal in litigation, if you always settle the case, regardless of the other side's reasonableness or lack of reasonableness, you're accepting some very bad deals. As a very junior lawyer, I asked my mentor, he was a junior partner in a very large firm, now he's a federal judge. I said, why do the lawyers in our firm never go to trial? Now that was a slight exaggeration, but very slight. And he told me, because it's too big a risk. Most of our lawyers don't have the skill sets or experience to try a case. And if you try a case and lose, you won't get paid, you might get sued, and there's a good chance you're going to ruin a client relationship for a more senior, more important partner at the firm. So when you get close to the trial date, you see a lot of arm twisting to get the client to settle the case, even if the terms being offered aren't all that great. What this means is that clients routinely get whiplash from outside litigation counsel. Counsel's gung-ho about the case at the outset, and they intend to vigorously litigate it. We're going to win this thing. Counsel remains positive throughout the bulk of discovery. But as the case gets closer to trial, outside counsel shifts 180 degrees, and now they are aggressively pushing the client to settle the case. You may have seen this happen in your own matters. If you and your litigator are not prepared to try a case, you get stuck with whatever settlement the other side is willing to stomach. It may turn out okay if the other side is reasonable, and it may not. But most litigators are not prepared to try a case, they are not willing to take on the risks of trying a case, and therefore they leave their clients at the mercy of the reasonableness or lack of reasonableness of the other side. It should not be this way. Third, litigating a case from the beginning with the goal of trial in mind will dramatically reduce costs. One of the telltale signs of a lawyer who is a pure discovery lawyer and does not have the necessary understanding of trial work is gross inefficiency in discovery. The reality is that most of what lawyers fight about in discovery just doesn't matter. Lawyers build tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in unnecessary discovery fights and in motions to compel to get materials that will not advance a client's story. Why? The cynic in me says somebody has a minimum billable hours requirement to meet. But there's more to it than that. I don't think most lawyers will intentionally fleece their clients in that way. The bigger problem is that they simply don't know what matters and what doesn't. Most cases are going to be decided based on a handful of pieces of paper. If you know the story you want to tell and know what documents are important to that story, you can avoid unnecessary fights over trivia. And for most litigators, this inefficiency grows the closer you get to trial. Lawyers who don't have experience with or an aptitude for trial work waste more time in the months leading up to the trial date. Finally, litigating the entire case like a trial lawyer will help in all other aspects of the case. Trial lawyers are storytellers, and a trial lawyer will develop the story throughout discovery. Now, This is obviously immensely helpful if the case goes to trial, but it's also immensely helpful even if it doesn't. Winning on summary judgment, for example, is easier if the brief identifies the missing elements in the plaintiff's case in the context of a compelling story. Judges are people too, and the story is an important persuasive tool with the court. Likewise, the case will be better positioned for settlement if you have developed a consistent, compelling story that you can share with the other side or with the mediator. There are many things that drive settlement, but one of those things is a risk of losing, and a well-developed story that the other side can understand and be concerned about is a valuable tool for settlement. So how specifically are most litigators failing? Or put it another way, how should your litigator be building your story during discovery? Now when we talk about this, I want to focus primarily on the deposition process because this is where in-house counsel tend to have the most difficult time evaluating their outside litigators. Storytelling requires the development of our factual pieces. Now, this is our story during the early stages of discovery. We have a jumbled jigsaw puzzle. Reality is it's a partial jigsaw puzzle because we don't have all the pieces. Now, we may be storytellers, but we're not novelists. We can't simply make up the facts for our story. Instead, we get handed a bunch of individual facts from our client, from the documents, maybe from common sense. We have to arrange what we have. And then, and this is important, we have to find additional pieces. 
Neither side gets all of the pieces. Both sides get some. We have to make a picture out of those and the ones we develop in the process. Our job in deposition is to get more puzzle pieces. And that sounds obvious, but it's not because most lawyers do a very poor job of it. So let's talk about how we do it. I want to take a relatively simple hypothetical. Let's imagine there's a dispute over control of a closely held company. And in that dispute, it's useful for both litigants to show that they are the owner who is most responsible for the company's growth and success. Now, in that case, I'm going to start with certain puzzle pieces. Probably most importantly, I'm going to have a large collection of documents for my client. Some of those documents will be good for me. Experience tells me that some of them will be bad. These are some of the starting puzzle pieces. Now, every lawyer engages in the same first step reviewing these documents and pulling out the most useful ones to use as deposition exhibits. So let's imagine I do that and I have an email from the other principal to my client about the company's biggest client, Acme. The email says, amazing job with Acme yesterday. That presentation was amazing. Now, when I teach at the National Institute of Trial Advocacy, the students I teach always want to do the same thing with a document like this. They show it to the witness, they demand that the witness agree that he wrote this email. They ask him to admit that the email statement is true. And then they immediately demand that the witness agree to their desired conclusion. So, my client Jim was responsible for landing Acme, or something like that. And the witness refuses to cooperate. They always do. So the questioner goes back again. But you said he did a great job on the Acme presentation. Yes, I said that. So obviously this presentation made the difference with Acme. No, and around and around they go. You see this sort of dance every day in conference rooms throughout the country. And my question is, what does a questioner get out of this? Yes, it's uncomfortable for the witness to go through that line of questioning. But so what? I recently had a case. My client had written a whole series of truly foolish emails that were not helpful a few years before the litigation started. And in deposition, opposing counsel went through each of them in the deposition. You wrote this, and you said this, and you said this. And on and on, this goes for 20 minutes. After the deposition, the witness thought things had gone horribly wrong. I said, no, that was great. Great, he asked? I said, yes. When opposing counsel walked out of that room, he didn't have anything other than what he already had when he walked in. The emails are bad. I don't deny it. I don't like them. I wish you hadn't written them. But he had those emails yesterday. Today, that's still all that he has. His deposition was meaningless. If we walk out of that deposition and we still have only the same useful fact, the one good email, and the best we can say is that, well, I think the other side is going to look like a liar denying all of my hard-hitting questions on this email, if that's what we have, we failed. Because storytelling requires the development of additional factual pieces that we can use. Now, how could we do that here? We think of all the facts that are true or more likely to be true in light of the good email. And we ask very specific factual questions so we can build a fuller, more compelling narrative. So the fact that this email exists tells us what? Well, it tells us that, opposing, that the opposing party thought that our client did very well in the presentation. We know that. So, what was so great about the presentation? Let's get the specifics in deposition. Why was the presentation important? What about our client's presentation was good? How did the other side know it was good? Has my client given other good presentations to clients? Who? When? See, the key to a good deposition is to understand that the good facts, the good documents, the good admissions from the other side are merely starting points. And our goal must be how to figure out what the additional facts are, which additional facts are likely true, or certainly true in light of the facts that we have. This way, we can build out a more complete, more persuasive story. So what are we not doing? We are not chasing conclusions. This is very important. First, I want to talk to you about 1950s transatlantic shipping advertisements. 
It was just an advertising slogan, a desperate attempt to keep the world from changing, really. In my childhood, I found it to be a terrible lie. The Cunard Line was the dominant transatlantic passenger service for much of the 20th century. You may have heard of the Lusitania, played a pretty important role in World War I, or the Queen Mary, which now sits in the harbor in Long Beach. These were Cunard ships. In the early 1950s, Cunard had a problem. The company realized that air travel was potentially going to make its services obsolete, and it needed to find a way to hold on to its customers. So it came out with a new advertising slogan, getting there is half the fun. Now, it's not, of course. From Odysseus to the Donner Party, history is full of examples of getting there not being much fun at all. Even so, my own mother would sometimes repeat this dishonest tagline to me as I sat in the back seat of our car on one of our lengthy road trips to see the grandparents. It was not half the fun. It wasn't in any way fun. But the journey to your destination, fun or not, is still critical. And many lawyers don't seem to understand this. They insist on spending their time chasing after conclusions. What do I mean? A conclusion is what you would conclude from a fact. It's what the fact leads the trier of fact to believe. Sally dropped the plate. Fact. Sally was reckless. Conclusion. Sally hit Bob. Fact. Sally has anger problems. Conclusion. Sally signed this agreement without reading it. Fact. Sally had no intention of performing that agreement. Conclusion. Often you can identify a conclusion because what you're trying to get is an adjective or an adverb. You might think of it as chasing characterizations. So what's the problem with chasing after conclusions? Isn't it great to get a conclusion? What if Sally admits to us that she really was reckless? That's gold. Conclusions are useful, and I do like to have them. But I see three fundamental problems with making your primary goal chasing conclusions. First. Conclusions are often hard to get. The witness may not know much. The witness often knows that agreeing to your conclusion is a problem. Sometimes this is because the witness can tell your conclusion is devastating to their side. Isn't it true, Sally, that you were reckless in carrying the plate the way you did? Now, Sally may not know much, but she knows she doesn't want to agree to that. Sometimes the witness knows you're chasing a conclusion because you highlight that fact. You make clear that this is a big, dramatic moment. So, what you're saying is, the witness knows better than agree to that. And conclusions, by their very nature, allow for wiggle room. You picked up the plate. It's tough to wiggle out of that. You picked up the plate carelessly. Now there's a fight. Second, if we want to get our conclusions or our characterizations, then we need to change our focus. You're likely to get much further with your witness by asking simple, factual questions that lead to your desired conclusion. Instead of demanding that Sally admit that she was reckless, ask the facts that would lead someone to that conclusion. You were carrying the plate on your head, wearing high heels, on a slip and slide, while juggling knives. If Sally says yes to those things, we've accomplished what we're trying to accomplish. The third problem with chasing after conclusions is that conclusions by themselves just aren't good enough. A conclusion is not a story. A conclusion is the moral of the story we want to tell, or maybe one of the lessons to be learned from the story we want to tell. But that's all it is. So let's say we have the conclusion we want. Sally was reckless. Maybe we had it before the deposition. Maybe Sally sent an email to a coworker that says, I was probably a little reckless with that plate. So there it is. In our document, we find that we have a fantastic conclusion. So what does that mean? Here's our cross at trial. Sally, you were reckless carrying that plate. Yes. We sit down. Or, Sally, you were reckless carrying that plate. No. So then we impeach her. Do you recognize this email? Did you write it? You sent this to your friend, didn't you? And you wrote you were a little reckless. Did I read that right? Yes. We sit down. What do we have? That's no cross. Imagine if we were to cross Sally with the questions we asked a minute ago. You were carrying the plate. You were carrying it on your head. You were wearing high heels. You were standing on a slip and slide. You were carrying it while juggling knives. Now, 
we don't have one star. We have an entire constellation of stars that light up the story we're trying to tell. These underlying facts will make all the difference. We've now told a story. We're not simply insisting that the jury accept our characterization. Conclusion alone is not effective. But with this collection of supporting facts, we have a solid cross-examination, frankly, regardless of whether Sally agrees with our ultimate conclusion. It no longer matters because the jury knows what the conclusion is based on the facts. The flip side of that is, if I don't have the facts, I may lose even with the conclusion that I liked so much. If Sally lays out a series of facts that would seem to support her story, that she was actually very, very careful carrying the plate. Sally tells us, well, I put stick them on my hands so the plate wouldn't slide. I wore bells so that when I walked around, it would alert people I was coming so nobody would inadvertently bump into me. I had a wingman with me at all times to look for obstacles. If Sally starts to lay out a story like this, to explain just how careful she was, it may not matter that she gave you this conclusion in an email, this conclusion you thought was so important. If the facts sound like she was careful, then even the admission that she was reckless may not help you ultimately. This is story development. It is what litigators should be doing, what, what most often they are not doing in deposition. It's just one example of how your outside litigator is probably failing you. So we talked about how the vast majority of litigators are essentially discovery lawyers and have little, if any, trial skills or experience. We've talked about some of the consequences that flow from that. We've talked in depth about one specific way in which lawyers should be doing more to develop their client's story. Now let me close with a few practical pointers to help you and your company. Obviously, because civil litigators try so few cases, it's difficult to distinguish between them. In the NBA or major college basketball, if you're trying to hire a coach, you can look at the outcomes of games to get some idea who a successful coach is. It's understandable why Phil Jackson or Mike Krzyzewski get paid good money. They've won a lot. But in our hypothetical basketball league, where teams almost never play a game, it's very difficult to distinguish between the coaches. And this is true, of course, with civil litigators. It's difficult to distinguish between them. It's a mistake to hand any substantial piece of litigation to a litigation team that cannot show you they have significant trial skills and experience. This doesn't mean that every member of the team must have significant trial skills and experience, but it does mean that at least one active member of the team needs to have it. Remember, the work of a trial lawyer starts well before trial. You cannot simply hand off a case to a trial lawyer at the last minute without having done at least some damage to your case. Second, make sure your outside litigators are developing your story. It isn't always obvious whether they are, so let me give you a few hints. You can, of course, look at the deposition transcripts and see whether the litigator is leveraging the good facts he walked in with in order to obtain other related facts that help build out a fuller, more compelling story. Or you can ask the litigator to identify the useful facts they got at deposition that they didn't already have going in the room. That means it doesn't count that they confronted the witness with a good quote in a document. They already had that quote. It doesn't help if the witness admits something that the other side has to agree to. You already had that. Instead, how did they leverage what they had walking in in order to get more? If they can't answer that question, that's a very bad sign. Now here's another thing you can do. Ask your outside lawyers about the other side's witnesses. What do you know about them? How will the other side present them at trial? What have they learned about the other side's witnesses that they didn't know before taking the case? I call this taking casting seriously. Everybody knows that casting is critical in movies. Apparently Daniel Craig is gonna do only one more James Bond movie and then they're gonna to have to replace him. If you read tomorrow in the paper, that the new James Bond would be Danny DeVito, you would know that that franchise is probably in deep trouble. Not because DeVito's a bad actor, he's very good and he's very experienced, but because the casting is all wrong. It's not believable. And so often lawyers want to tell a story without taking casting into account. They simply try to shoehorn the witnesses into various roles, regardless of how believable those roles are. This is always dangerous because our own client often has such a distorted view of the other side. The other side is greedy or selfish or wicked. 
or in some other way deeply morally stunted. Our client always believes they've been wronged and they have a perception of the other side that is flat, one-sided, and extreme. A good trial lawyer doesn't buy into this characterization. Why? Because the person the jury sees on the witness stand will be very different from your client's characterization. If you don't take casting seriously, it can ruin your case. Finally, insist on honesty from your counsel. For many lawyers, their view of the case shifts not because of new evidence, and certainly not because the law changes, but because the timing has changed. At the beginning, when the lawyer is trying to land the case and convince the client to spend money, the lawyer is excited about the case and eager to win it. Everything is positive. And this lasts until the case gets close to trial. And now the lawyer sees little about the case that's positive. All of the good aspects of the case that the lawyer once crowed about, now they're not so good. And the other side's formerly weak arguments are now, surprisingly, very, very strong. If this is what you hear from your litigator, be wary. Because lawyers who do this, and there are many of them, are telling you what you want to hear to get you to hire them and give you money. And then later, they tell you what they have to tell you in order to get you to settle the case. Why? Maybe because the case has genuinely changed. Or maybe because they're afraid of trial. Maybe they don't want to take the risk and they'd rather have you take a bad deal. Question them closely and carefully about the reasons for their change. Compare what they say now to their earlier emails. And if you think you're being played, it's time to find a new lawyer. We've covered a lot today, and now we're out of time. There is, of course, a lot more to cover, hopefully at some future time. I want to leave you with this. Effective storytelling is hard. It's not something that happens by accident. It's something that you develop over years of very focused effort. How do you get the jury to overcome its mistrust of lawyers to listen to you? How do you help a jury get past its mistrust of big corporations? so they won't assume that the company was acting from improper motives. What non-rational factors affect how judges and juries see your witnesses? And what do you have to do in your storytelling to overcome that? And of course, there are many, many other considerations like this. This is important work, and it's important that it be done well. Civil litigators don't try cases all that often. Some never do. And this affects how everybody practices. It affects how litigators work, it affects what information in-house lawyers have when they hire outside litigators. But trials still matter, and trial skills and experience matter a great deal. You have to make your determination based on incomplete evidence. Some years ago, in the, in the third of the Indiana Jones movies, Indy walks into the room with all these potential cups. His job is to choose which one is the Holy Grail. And he's doing it based on very little information, and there are huge consequences based on his decision. His life, his father's life, lots of other things too. And what the knight tells him is what I would tell you. Choose wisely. <laughs>